Welcome everybody to the flight deck. Okay, we're doing that as a, that's my key to know where this goes. Um, there are more people from more places that are watching this. And so we just, I have to key that up. That way I know where it goes. Um, pray for me now that um, God's been marinating me in this word. And um, I showed Kim, you know, I have these big post-it notes, right? that go up on my wall and I start writing on that. And there's times when it gets so involved. There are so many things going on in there. And, and I am, I mean, God is just breathing all this in. And then it's like, okay, how do I now make that coherent, right? And, and make it presentable so you can get it and make it, make it sh as short and simple and to the point as I can, right? Because you don't need complexity, right? Simplify, said Semperfy is one of the words from Jim Shadrach there that I'm trying to keep taking on. So I don't know if I've done that or not, but we're going to try that, okay? And uh, so this is the first sundown hit tonight okay is it is it sundown yet it's almost getting there uh, when sundown crosses over we cross and in, cross into cross okay i have a lift we cross into the fifth king james there we go king james we cross over into the fifth month the fifth biblical month and it's a it's it's a critical time for certain stuff so we're going to talk about that but just a quick recap i just want to make sure we're clear that we keep pressing you towards a biblical worldview. do you get that it's one of the things that's lacking, like we, we, sometimes we can do okay with presenting the news about Jesus and we get people there, but we don't do what Jesus commanded, which was we go and make converts, but we forget to go and make disciples, disciples right? And disciples is getting a really biblical worldview. And so this pair of glasses on here, I wanted to give you that, is part of that getting that worldview so it's getting focus. And I didn't have time, but I'm going to do it on a future slide when I start to darken in those because what happens is we get a lot of overlays over that. For instance, we get a Greek mindset, a Western mindset, and we try to apply that to a biblical worldview, and God's like, no, 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 no. Biblical worldview is only understood by a biblical perspective, and that is a Hebraic perspective, yes. right? Okay, and there's things that the Greek mind just can't deal with it, and then we try to force scripture into that, and that's like, that's moving us out of a biblical worldview. Do you understand it? It's running Bible through another set of glasses called the Greek mindset. Analytical, okay, and everything. And God's like, okay, well, knock yourself out, but you're missing some things. We just want to track with a biblical worldview. So we do this and we try to look at things. Your finances go through that, your relationships, your marriage, your family, your work, even about governments, plural, right? Multiple governments, how the governments, we look at all that. And then we also look at time. Like the church has done decently on some of these things with a biblical worldview, but time is often one that we miss, and so we want to pick up that up because we think God's moving in time. And so we're in the fifth month, and there are five months, there, there are 12 months, and there are 12 tribes, right? And God has just stationed each one of those tribes <laughs> along with the month. So we look at those two, it gives us a point of reference. It always points us back to scripture, back to scripture, back to scripture. And so in this fifth month, there are 10 verses that specifically say, in the fifth month, this. And I always just love to people who talk to people who don't believe any of this is true and then say, then why did God put these in there? Was he just throwing away words? Was it just casual? There are, by the way, 48 verses referring to Simeon, either as the person, the tribe, the area. And there are more references by time. In other words, one of the references that we have for this coming month or for last month actually is anchored back the month before because we know when Pentecost was, right? We know the exact date. On the sixth day of the third month, blah, 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 blah. And then we know that Moses was down for one day and up for how many days was he before the Lord? 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights. We know when he came down and we know what happened then. That was the 17th of Tammuz. Okay, it was not a good thing. We talked about that last month. We'll touch on it briefly this time. So some of those, so we know now 40 days from that, we know things that are happening sometimes by reference to it. So anyway, let me give you just some quick highlights because we're going to, pass through this kind of fast and then go into some other things because I want to connect it. Number one, the number five in scripture is most often a reference to the word grace, right? Are you up for some grace in this month? Yes. You, got, you got to hear this, okay? Because if you were purely from a Jewish perspective, this month of off is, is a pretty awful month. We look through redeemed eyes, right? Restored vision from the Messiah. And so we pick up on the grace theme. The grace theme is there in the Old Testament, but we, we really want to grab hold of it. 
Secondly, Av is actually a Babylonian name for this month. It's been tradition for years and years and years. But the interesting thing, do you know what Av means in Hebrew? Father. It means Father, thank you. So right now, we're talking about grace and we're talking about the Father. You good on this so far? Okay. Next, Simeon means to hear, but not just to hear as in, yeah, I hear you. It's to hear and to obey, to respond to it, right? You up for that? You want to walk in that this month? I'm just telling you things that are aligned with this month so you can pull that out. And so this is a month that God intended to bring Israel into the promised land. It's known for the fact that on the 9th of Av, they said, we're not going. They listened to the bad report, right? <coughs> And we're going to go into that more next week. But it's a month that Israel grieves because they refuse to move forward on the promise. That's what happened, right? But what was the Father's intent by grace is that they hear and obey. Are you seeing all this? So what will your decision be in this month? To move by grace, hear and obey the voice of the Father, right? Are you up for that? Okay, because there's... What was going to happen if they moved into the promised land? Milk and honey. Milk and honey, okay? Fighting. They were going to have to fight, right? <laughs> but God had made it clear that he was making the provision. Okay, so a month of the divine intent. Do you see where that pencil has erased the word in and left possible? It's going to go beyond that. But so, just some quick themes. Move in the grace and favor of God in this month, in the fifth month, okay? Also, lean into the Father's heart for us. The intent of the Father, the love of the Father, the love of the Father. Hear it, accept his word, move in obedience into the fullness of the promise. And then finally, but there is choice and consequence. Amen. Right? So God's always giving us, okay, choose life, death, blessing, cursing, right? Free will. We're back to that again. But I want to go beyond this eliminating of the I am on possible and we go into this, which is promised. You see, we move from impossible to possible to promised. You get that transition? Most of us are trying to just get over from impossible to possible. It's impossible for this to happen. Well, maybe it's possible, right? Most of us are getting to that point. Well, I don't know if God will do this, but I know he can. Yes? Yes. Okay, you're, I'm missing some of my louder people here tonight, so you're all being kind of quiet and subdued. So. Come on, are you awake? Yeah. Yes. Uh, do I need to have you stand up and jump in? Okay. <laughs> just have to make sure. So we have to move then from impossible, possible, and then into promised and understand that. And then when it's promised, just as the promised land was there, then we still have to act on that. And it's a month about whether or not at that point of decision we will tip over. Okay, so some quick anchor points. Biblical events in the calendar, you know this. First month, Passover, crucifixion. Third month, we're going to jump to Pentecost, and that's at Sinai where the word is given, where they hear the voice of God. And the presence of the Lord comes down top of the mountain and they're not sure how to deal with it. So Moses goes up. It's then, you know, 1,500 years later when the Holy Spirit falls on um, Jerusalem in the upper room with 120. The fourth biblical month, which just came out, is mainly known about the golden calf and the broken tablets. By the way, it just kind of amused me as I wrote tablets. Because it's like every generation there's tablets, right? I mean, it was where, take two tablets and call me in the morning, right? That was the doctor thing. And now tablets have a different meaning. But it's kind of funny how they keep popping up in the culture and it's always as a remedy. Is it a fix for what ails you? Do you get, it's just kind of an interesting thing. <laughs> so we've moved more tech, but it's always back to the future, right? Now take two of these and call us. Okay, so, and then in this fifth month, the highlighted event in all of this really is the refusal to cross over because it sets a pattern in Israel that is devastating because they've never broken that by the kind of repentance that it needs to do. So let me show you this because there's a couple of plumb lines that God drops down in there, but there's a tie between the fourth and the fifth month and we're in it right now. So I want to talk about that. 17th of Tammuz is when the tablets were broken. The ninth of Av is when they refuse to go over. So we have the golden calf on one side. We have the crossing over, refusing to cross over on the other side. And then years later, as a consequence of this, on the 17th of Tammuz, it's the day when the walls are breached in Jerusalem. There's a consequence that's played, not only out immediately, but years later. And then they're refusing to cross. Both temples are destroyed in the same time zone, in the same time on the ninth of Av the first temple and the second temple. 
So this time between these two is a huge thing for Israel for mourning, right? In this time, it's called the Straits. The first one I see, it's a model where they won't wait, or we won't wait, because Moses was gone, they get tired, they go back to an old model. The second time is a problem where they won't move, they get stuck in the transition. They made the transition into the wilderness. When Moses was missing at Sinai, they kind of want to go back, so that's why they reinvent the golden calf, right? Well, they try to merge it with worship to Yahweh. But now they've been out for a year and three weeks, and they get out there, but they refuse. Now they're stuck in the wilderness in the transition point, and they won't cross over. So this three-week period of time here is called the Straits. Right? Some of you know this. Some of this is new, but it's not a bad review. It's a pressing time between these two places. They won't have marriages. They won't do parties. This is a very serious time in Israel. Now, does it need to be that way for you? No. Why? Grace. The grace. The grace of the Lord, right? So that we can go into a situation, but then why would God keep this in the calendar? Why do you think he would give biblical and historical references to make sure that we remember these points? Hello? Mm -hmm. Why? What he saved us from. Okay, good. Why else? So that would be the Egypt coming out of there, right? Don't fall back, don't go back to the old pattern. And then what's the other part of that anchor? From and to, right? We're not just saved from something, we're saved towards something, which is that promise, right? Because most of the church is still stuck out here in the wilderness. We're just going round and round and round and round. We refuse to cross over. We often see Jordan as being death. Oh, that's the promised land. That's when you go to heaven. No, it's here and now, right? We got to walk that out. So this time of the straits reminds us, any of you feel stressed lately or pressed or confined or constrained by something? Finances, relationships, politics, health? Okay. So, you know, God is once again reminding us there's a time of the straits and there's a time when God ordains straits because of the things that we've walked in and then how we respond to that in the middle of it is really critical. And so if I had to, oh, by the way, here's some anchors. Sundown July 4th is when the straits started. If you were aligning the calendars, right, the, the biblical calendar. Again, I always call it biblical rather than Hebraic because it's in my Bible. I don't call them the Ten Jewish Commandments. I call them the Ten Commandments, because right? So i got to break that habit. And then it's sundown July 25th is when it kicks the change on the 9th of off. So it's that three week. And so it's, here's the, you ever go to a mall? You are here. We're in the middle of it now, okay? Not to freak out, but be aware, this is a time when there's a lot of attention on that. And we're just paying attention. Okay, God, you anchored that in history. You didn't have to, but there's a reason why you want us to look at it in this time. It's just that simple. Okay. So the fourth biblical month, we talked about the idolatry. There was a danger to return to the past season. There's a danger while we're waiting, waiting, waiting for God to do the next thing. And we're just, nah, it's really hard to wait. And we want to go back to the old pattern. Well, that worked. That worked. And this is just silence. So that's always a danger. But there's also an opportunity because in the same time that Israel was down messing it up with the idol, Moses is up before the glory. He's just baking in the glory. Getting the download, getting revelation, right? So that month provides that, that hinge there. The ninth of Av, we have to watch agreement with bad reports. This is the month when the spies come back. We're going to look more at that next week, right? But there's a choice about where is your focus going to be? What report are we going to listen to? And then there's the challenge of then not moving forward with the change when God says, no. Get off your butt and go. Right? And so the, the dilemma is always that we, we feel trapped in the waiting. We've been waiting, we've been waiting. And then there's the time when God says, no. And so often we will just stay stuck. We will refuse. And we get into this confine. And so I just began to, to, pre to, to seek the Lord more and more in terms of this, this straits, this narrowing, this confine. And he began to show me something that I, just, I guess I'd never seen before. That this process is how God makes new wine. You all want the new wine, right? Yes. Been hearing that a lot. New wine, new wineskins, right? 
talked about that. This was kind of something that you can push back on me because I've not heard this before, but it just seems so clear. So here we go. This verse says, John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. Correct? Yes, correct. So we have to abide in order to bear fruit. Is that the end of the story? No. So I'm out here and I'm being really tracking with God and I've borne great fruit. Is that it? No. Aren't I pretty? <laughs> Look at me. I got joy, peace, patience, right? right. Okay, there's, there's more. So, what's the end of these? Where are these headed? I am the vine, you are the branches. In Jesus' time, where were the bulk of these going? What were they going to become? Okay. So, there's a little bit of a process here. Bearing fruit doesn't end the process. It's the middle of it. And they go here. Do you know what that is? That's a wine press. This has been the kind of wine press that Jesus was around. I think this one is actually maybe concrete or something, but it's the same format with stones, right? It just would have been a place, and this is where the fruit gets plucked and the fruit gets dropped. And if the fruit drops there, is it going to make it to what it needs to do? It's intended to. Yeah. Is it going to get where it needs to go right here? No. no. What's it going to do if it just sits there? It's going to rot. So there is another necessary point. Oh, by the way, yeah. Here, let's just add some things because I think this is kind of interesting. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience. You all fell off. Come on, some of you have it memorized. Together, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Would you agree that's the fruit of the Spirit? Yes. This is kind of a weird thing for me just as I know I haven't... I want you to understand that's a really critical and we have to move in that but I but I think the new wine has a source here but there's a process that has to do with the narrows okay and it comes in on this to make omelets you have to break a few eggs right you know that phrase right okay well to make wine you have to crush a lot of grapes yeah, and the problem is, you know, it'd be something if they just sort of started to do that. But if, if we start to think about this is, is all this fruit that, I've, that God has borne through my life. And has this been easy? Sort of, but sort of hard, right? I've got to abide in Him. That shouldn't be hard, but it's a struggle. It's a struggle. So often I want to all pull back. God's pruning, doing all sorts of things. And these things, oh great, I've got all these great things coming out of my life and God goes, okay, we're not done with those. <laughs> so he's going to take these lovely attributes and skills and characteristics that I have. And he's going to go, Stephen, we got up squeeze them hard. I think they'd be better if you trampled them. Mm. Yeah, you know, I'd probably be better if God would just take them in his hand and do this. Because it's an important stage. But it's like, but God, I spent so much time in Bible study and prayer and so many people have prayed for me to bear all this fruit and now you're just squeezing the snot out of it. <laughs> okay, you tracking? Yeah, as Martha said, Lucy. Lucy? the pressing process usually involves other people. You remember the lesson a couple of weeks ago about Jesus spit? It's been one of the strangest ones ever. <laughs> about an assault of God, sometimes right at a point of our identity, right at a point of wounding or other things. And the issue is, is that I think God a lot of times when he's making new wine will use other people to stomp all over our grapes. Mm. Mm. <laughs> 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 
Okay? You know? And it's just like, it, it, there's a decision point in this. This is the narrows. The narrows is a confining. The narrows for me now has become a, a, understanding a wine press. But it's not mechanical. It's like the old kind. Where they, fruit's in there and then you get people to stomp on it. And it's painful, right? You all prayed for me a lot and in and through a lot going down to a meeting in Florida. And I had to release a really hard word. And I've been feeling pretty strong. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it was that God was wanting to get the wine, yes. the new wine, and the only way it was going to happen is by all that great fruit that I was moving, <laughs> being exposed, cut, and squeezed. Make sense? So Jesus, just as an example, because I got thinking about this, I thought. What about the new wine in Jesus? Jesus was the new wine, and, and the Lord was pressing me, and I came to this, that where did the new wine come from? Jesus walked in all the fullness of the Spirit, right? All the fullness, all the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I think I got them all there. Nine of them, right? And then he moved in all the gifts of the Spirit, right? All out there. But it wasn't enough. Do you understand? This is where the disciples didn't get it because it had to go through the grape press. There was a pressing Jesus had to go through. His body broken, which we're going to do here. His body squeezed and the new wine, which is his bloodshed. That is the new wine and that is the process. So, the disciples couldn't grasp it. They thought, why have to go through the cross? This is really good. We got people that want to make you king. You just fed 15,000 people, at least 5,000 plus all their families. Come on, right? Jesus had to, no, it ain't the way, because it has, the new wine had to come through this. You know, that, that wine, the word uh, grape is dom, and that's also the word mud. Hmm. Say Hebrew word. Hebrew root. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So look at this. This is Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, since we have, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. There's an immediate word of encouragement to you, okay? In the pressing, in the feeling pressed, do not lose heart. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. But then right here, we are hard-pressed on every side. Do you see the narrows? But not crushed, we're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You see the pressing, the pressing, the pressing that's going on. But watch this. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So look at this two phrases right here. We carry about the death of Jesus, okay, and we are alive are always being given over to death, so that the life of Jesus, so that his life, what is his life? It's the new wine, right? So when I got all these great fruit of the Spirit, my great love, and I come and bring it, my great patience, and I bring it to you, my ability, limited though it is at times, of self-control, right? <laughs> and I'm in front of somebody and they just crush it. They just stomp on it. I've got to get this perspective. Okay, new wine. New wine. New wine. It's part of the straits process. I don't know, I kind of thought before having the fruit was kind of the end of the story. This has recalibrated me in that way. Okay, so key to this, in the midst of going through the straits, this is, this is so, so key. 
God took me, uh, God starts bouncing me around to different scriptures. So he took me into Hebrews 4. And this part, today when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did that day in the wilderness. When we're in a pressing time, there's always a choice of hardening our heart, a resentment to God. Why did you bring me out here? Weren't there enough graves back in Washington, D.C.? That's a personal story, right? <laughs> Weren't there enough unemployment lines in Washington, D.C.? You know, okay, whatever. Whatever the thing is, right? Wasn't there healthy? Whatever your issue is. There's a real chance of doing that is God is just saying if you want the the press comes and the choice of what comes out of that is ours but it's largely turned right at this point whether we will harden our heart. And it links to this part about striving to enter rest. Did you did you see that it started on sundown on the on the 4th of July? That fourth, the, the fourth is a Saturday, which is a Shabbat. So this thing tees up right after a Sabbath. And it ends right after a Sabbath. I was thinking originally it started on a Sabbath, but it, it actually right after. And I thought, boy, that means I've got to go in with a rest and rest perspective. I want you to see this almost like a sandwich. Okay? Remember grace? I want you to put Sabbath in that same idea. There's a rest and there's a rest for going through the straits. That's the framework. I can't be always like this. I've got to, okay, I've got to rest. I've got to, when I get crushed, when that thing's coming at me and it's hard, I've got to submit to the Lord, resist the devil. That means, Lord, I bless you, I praise you. This is, this is not easy. Wow. Okay. But I'm going to stay connected to you. I'm going to stay connected to you. I'm going to stay connected to you. I'm going to rest in you. This verse from Hebrews, which is right after about the not letting your hearts be hardened. Therefore, strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall short by the same sort of disobedience. The disobedience is where they did not combine the promise with faith, with trust and believing God was going to break it through forward. It leads right into the ninth above. They didn't trust that God was going to take care of them and step out. And in the midst of being pressed, and they were being pressed by what they were seeing out there in the way of the giants, right? They're being in this time of the straits. And the report came down, they don't make it. And that word is so interesting. I love that, strive to enter rest. So the word strive here in the Greek means to hasten or do it quickly, to exert yourself, to endeavor, to give diligence to. So it's this weird thing. Almost like, it seems like an oxymoron, right? Strive to rest. But it's strive to enter the rest. That means there's actually, there's a work involved, but the work is a work of faith. The work is, God, I'm going to choose rather than to curse to bless your name. I'm not going to follow Job's wife's advice. When Job was pressed, Job's wife said, curse God and die. Which is pretty much what happened out in the desert, just so you know, right? Because Israel would not believe God. The reproach of Egypt was slapped on them and against God because they would not believe him for what he wanted to do. So, how will we make it through the straits? There is the fear factor on one side and there is the reality test on the other. The reality test is the promise of God. And the question I want you to keep coming to, especially when you're given to worry and anxiety. I was talking to two different people and then within 24 hours and both times it came up about just being very worried about stuff. And in both times I kind of had to say, so how's that working for you? Is, go ahead. Yeah, but if we let me let me go back. Yeah, I want to I want to get there. But again, if you're any of you worried today? Yes, no. Did you worry about something today? Put your hand up. Okay. Did you didn't worry about anything today? Okay, I just asking. Okay. Okay. Well, any of you have some chronic stuff out there that's worrying you? Just you don't have to raise your hand. But I just have the question: How's that working for you? Is that changing things? That's, that's the question. So here's one of my favorite quotes. Don't tell me that worrying doesn't work. Don't tell me it doesn't work. Do you know why? Because all the things I worry about never happen. So clearly it works. 
If I worry about it, it won't happen. <laughs> I saw it years ago on a poster in college. I just cracked up. I went, okay, this is, this is, this is my kind of logic, okay? I, you have to understand, um, if I worry about it, if I think about it, if I plan and plot, et cetera, et cetera, enough around it, it won't happen. Now, it's not going to not happen anyway, right? But I somehow think if I'm that prepared, and it's completely, it's a self-idolatrous thing. It's a self-reliance thing. It's a control thing. It's me wanting to have it done a certain way and trying to control, manipulate, plan, whatever I have to do in order to do that. So God, you know, I never get to get up here without God taking me through it first. I'm in the wine press, okay? And at least I'm understanding that out of this now there's going to be new wine. That's kind of amazing. So, okay. A couple of references. Which of you by worrying can add a single cubit to your lifespan? That's an old King James thing, but I just kind of like it sometimes. Levi came to me and said, what is a cubit? Right? Um, so it's a measurement. So in other words, that's not going to do it. And then how about this one? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think on these things. Dwell is another translation. Dwell. Let your mind dwell on these things. Where are our thoughts? In the middle of the straits, where are our thoughts going to dwell? And that's going to determine what comes out of there. So, there is a guaranteed outcome of going through the straits. This is absolutely 100% guarantee. I will guarantee you there will be new wine in your life going through the streets. Do you believe me? Yes. Okay, the question is just this. There will be new wine. The question is whether it will be this new wine or this new wine. Uh. <laughs> you got it. The streets will guarantee, they're guaranteed, 100% guarantee you will have new wine. Or, or you will actually try to co-blend them and you will have whiny wine. And most people around you can tell you when you're trafficking in whiny wine. Well, praise the Lord, just this, this you know, and that, and that person, I really need to pray for them. God bless them. You know what, yeah, right? It's the southern way of... <laughs> oh, bless her heart. Little tramp, bless her heart. Right? So there will be wine, regardless, new wine, one way or the other. So here's the process. The straits happen. And God, I think, brings us around to key us in so that we take this learning for the rest of the year. Because you will have, do you agree you'll have straits come into you different times during the year? Sure. This is a time when God brings it to focus. It's like, celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus. You want to do that all the time, right? The blood bringing a fresh and new into your life and cleansing off the sin and his life fresh and new. But there's a time and place linked with Passover where God wants us to focus and really make sure we get that down and then we carry it through the rest of the year. It's the same goes with this. So here's my progression that I think. In God's process, okay, you're grafted in. Would you agree? You have been grafted in. You're in the vine. Now, there is a question because Jesus says in John 15, go back and read that, if you abide in me, if you remain in me. And he says, if a man doesn't abide, this is what happens. So there is an abiding, and then out of that there is a bearing of fruit, and out of bearing of fruit there is a pruning, there is a picking of the fruit, and then there's this step that is new to me thinking about it, it being pressed and out of that comes the new wine. And out of that new wine comes this amazing grace overtone. You know what an overtone is in a wine? Right? It, it's, it's that when you breathe the wine, it's, it's that bouquet. bouquet, it's that overtone. It's, it's, oh, it's there. It's, it, it tastes like grace, right? And that comes in your life. Now, the process will happen, regard the straits are there, and so there will, you will be processed. <laughs> you will be processed by the straits. It's just, it's the way they work. So the enemy has a process. 
he can't, you are grafted in, he's got that. So he's going to deal with it in another way. And that's where he's just going to try to move you out of not abiding. And if you can do that, then you will still bear fruit. You're just going to bear other fruit. And then instead of being pruned, you will be cut. And there will be a bitterness with that process and a resentment at God and an anger at other people. And so that same fruit and stuff will all get pressed. In, uh, in winemaking, they call it the must. That's when the, the uh, seeds and the skins and the, even the leaves are all left in the wine. And you will get a new wine. And it will have a bitter aftertaste. Guaranteed process, right? You choose this month. How are you going to do? You want to be in the new, good in the new wine, right? With, <laughs> now I can't say it without you going. Well, which one do you want? All right. So, this always cracks me up. This book. I'm sure it's a good book. I should have read it at some point. Pouring new wine into old wine skins. Now the subtitle's fine. How to change a church without destroying it. That's that's a good <laughs> subtitle. But they should have made it the main title. Do you know why? Because somebody, I think it was Jesus, said, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. And personally, I don't want to write something contrary to what Jesus was very explicit about. <laughs> but then I got thinking, maybe part of the problem here is that I have been thinking some ways about the new wine. Because we keep talking, right, about new wine. The new wine coming in and needing a new structure, needing a new, a new wineskin to hold it. But it always refers to the new wine being in almost like a building in a structural sense. Do you see like, like, like it's right here? That that's where the new wine is going to show up, in that building. That's where you got to go and get the new wine. Do you, do you get, you're tracking that. Oh, a revival will break out. Where is it happening? Oh, it's over here at so-and-so church. That's been kind of the thought, right? Hello? Okay. What if instead it's not so much about the new wine is not so much about churches, it's about the followers of us as Jesus. What if the new wine is really that if we're willing to let God deal with that fruit and let it get pressed and crushed, that there will be new wine that will come out of that because it's just what Jesus did. He had to literally offer up, right? All the fruitfulness of his life had to be offered up and pressed so that the new wine came out. And I'm just wondering if God isn't doing that with believers now across the world. And so if you're in this press, I want to encourage you that I think you're a place where God wants to move in new wine. Now the process is painful. Well, you know, Steve, most people move at the speed of pain. Most people move, say more. Most people move at the speed of pain. I know I do. What do you mean by that? Well, I, you know, it has to hurt bad enough before I take action. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the way it seems. Okay. I wish it wasn't that way, but it seems that way. Yep. 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 Well, and the question again is going to come when we're at this point. Let me give you this other part of how God started to speak to all this is when I knew we were. I was going to talk on the straits. I started searching for a picture of a carrier going through straits, and this picture came up. And it shifted some of my understanding about going through the straits. There's a beauty here. I'm going to show you more of the picture in a second. But this is from a Psalm of David. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called the Lord. I cried to my God for help. Does this sound like straits to you? Yeah. <laughs> like someone being really pressed? From his temple he heard my cry. My voice came before him into his ears. But then watch this. You broaden the path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn. What I, I started to draw out that I, I, I didn't get a slide made on, but there's a narrow place that comes down that's compressed, compressed, compressed. And if in this we turn as David did to God, then I think there's a broadening out in that place so that we can move like this carrier moving through these straits. Now, I don't know if you can see closely enough, but there, there aren't planes coming and going on that. A lot of the crew is out on the deck. They're at rest. They're just watching the beauty of being in the strait. There's the rest component again. 
Now, they're alert, right? They'll have a submarine somewhere in that strait because it would be a very dangerous place. The radar is gone. There's a lot of systems that are in play, but they're in a state of rest in the middle of a strait. And because a strait will always have to do with transition. If you're in straits now, whenever you're in one, know that it's because God is moving you and transitioning you into something else. That's how a strait works. And you have to be in movement. It will be restricted. There are dangers there, but the biggest danger is how you respond to it. If we get hard of heart, oh, this is so, God, I'm done, I'm tired, I don't want to do this anymore. New wine with an H. Okay. And then how God kind of tied this together. Rick Wallach is a guy who's, uh, a friend of mine has been supporting, paying for me to have some coaching myself, which is nice. You know, I coach a lot of people, so it's good to have someone kind of completely outside, brings a very different perspective. We had talked Saturday morning, was very helpful. And then he sent me this text and just kind of tied in. The mind takes its shape from whatever it rests upon. Let your mind dwell on these things. If we are fixating on bad report, on all the other kind of stuff, your mind will begin to take shape of whatever you're focused upon. You will get more of what you focus upon. Amen. If I am focusing on the pain, I will get more pain. It's just the way it works. <laughs> Lastly, energy flows where attention goes. It might. Oh, don't get them. Don't get them. He stomped all over my grapes. Right? If I go there with that kind of thing, I'm going to get. Okay, you want to hang out there? You want to live there? That's where the energy is going to flow. Rather than, God, you're good. God, you're, you're birthing new wine in me. You're doing a new thing. Thank you, Lord. More fruit, more fruit, more fruit, more new wine. I need more new wine to flow through. So, here are the takeaways. There will be new wine or new wine. The straits are a way God uses to create new wine. Do you agree now? That was kind of just an amazing thing. Go ahead. I was listening to a tape. Yes, a tape. <laughs> Coming over here. <laughs> what? And he was, uh, he said, change the surroundings and you change the man. Change the heart and you change the surroundings. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Where is the focus mm -hmm. upon that? So that. So, the straits are a way that God uses to create new wine. New wine comes from being, from pressed fruit poured out. This usually involves stomping. <laughs> some of you need some more new wine, come to me, I'll be happy to stomp for a while. <laughs> the way through is to not harden our hearts. Okay? In the midst of that, guard how you react. Watch the report of your lips. A state of rest is key. And get this phrase, be alert and actively rest. Strive, therefore, to enter that rest. To strive is to be aware of the ways that the enemy wants to, A, either have you do nothing, which is not rest. Doing nothing is not the same as rest. I won't go more into that, but you, you want to know some more. Stephen, what is your biblical, what is your definition of rest? What? Of rest is to be actively in the, in the presence of God presence. and to be aware of His goodness mm -hmm. and provision. Yeah. If I can stay in there, yeah, I, I've got I've to I've suspend a lot of my disbelief, my suspicion, my fears and all that. No, 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 okay. You may be able, I love, I uh, can't remember the psalm reference, David. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. It's a clear thing. David's not denying that there's not fear that comes up. Mm -hmm. When that happens, I will make this choice. I will deflect. When I, oh, oh I'm going to trust. I'm just going to make this active choice. So when the anxieties come, the question is, how's that working for you? Is that producing? I, you know what, I, I need... Lord, show me the root of that. Why, why do I always go to fear here? Your word says otherwise. You know, fear and faith, both are things that are future and they both require and ask for obedience. 
Fear is anxiety. Faith comes in peace. You know, perfect love casts out all fear. Yeah, but I'm, I'm struggling to get to that perfect love place. But the more that I understand his heart for me, this is one of the biggest transformations over the years for me, is trusting his heart. I may not like how it all goes, but I, I'm trusting his heart. I was on a, a call the other day and this guy was kind of trying to pull apart Job and saying that, well, when Job said the Lord gives and takes away, that's not true. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. He was trying to say it's always the enemy who takes away. And I went, no, 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 no. Every good father knows there's times when you have to take something away from someone you love for their good. And I thought, why can't we just, that's again, that's kind of trying to put that Greek framework mm -hmm. over it. And the biblical one says, no, God, God can be tough. The heart, though, is there. So even in the midst of that now, and even in the hardship, I'm learning to trust his heart for me. God, I don't understand it. I don't understand why this is happening, but it's okay. I'm trusting your heart for me. I don't have to understand it anymore. I, I'm getting over my own intellectual whatever. You know, arrogance, I guess, would be the word. Well, you know, our children, don't, and they, don't, they don't understand a lot of times when we take things from, away from them that ultimately are not going to be good for them. I mean, you know, Matthew talks about, you know, the father would not, I would not give you snakes, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. good father. That's, you just got to stand on that scripture and realize that a lot of times what we think is good for us, if we look back on it later, we we'll see that it was it would. Yep, yep. I love the phrase, I think it's from Soren Kierkegaard, that life can only be lived forward, but only understood looking backward. You know, we don't understand it until later on we look back, oh, that's what God was doing all that time. Meanwhile, we've got to live forward in faith. We'll get the understanding later. So often it's like, well, God, when I understand this, then I'll do it. <laughs> uh, you want that kind of guarantee by a dishwasher. Oh, understanding. Yeah. The straits are also a way that the enemy uses to create new wine and our decision response determines the outcome. You got it? So behold here in the elements of the bread and the wine, and by the way the tall goblet has wine and the short one has grape juice, so whichever. But it's, we always do communion when we enter into a new month. Because we're crossing over into something new and we want to be refreshed and reinvigorated in all the things of Jesus, right? Because all the promises of God that we talk about here are yes and amen in Jesus. And this means of grace and truth. And so he was pressed, he was crushed. You know, so taking his body, literally being, I won't mangle it. But his body was, yeah. And by his stripes, on his body, he bore all of our sins, all of our sickness, all of our oppression, all of our depression, all the things that we stumble, all the ways in which we've not been abiding and resting in him, he bore all of that on his body. And then in like manner, he took the cup after supper. When he gave given thanks, he gave it to them and said, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood the new wine. Lord, we just thank you. Wow. <laughs> new wine, God. New wine. Jesus died to bring the new wine. Lord, I raise this up now. The body and the blood of Jesus. And I raise this up as a testimony into the heavens that all here who will partake of this come into and under the covenant and the protection of Jesus Christ. 
The blood shed is a testimony into the heavens that this one is marked and that one is marked of God. Set aside. His body broken so that the temple curtain would be torn in half top to bottom and we would stand boldly before the throne. We have been fully grafted in and we remain and abide as beloved, as adopted, as cherished. Lord, take these now, these means of your grace and your truth and remind us who we are because of who you are. And Lord, out of this then, give us the grace and truth to let whatever straits we go through work for your new wine. To press that from us, what needs to be pressed, so that we understand how to move forward, that we carry about in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus so that the life of Jesus would be greater. This is about the life of Jesus in us. We bless your name. We thank you for these gifts. All glory and honor to Jesus. Amen.